Welcome back to our Teach Out on Concussion. I'm here today with Mark Yule, the Executive Director from the Michigan High School Athletic Association. Mark, welcome. Thanks for making the trip down from Lansing. Good to be with you, Steve. So if you can help our audience out today, can you uh, give a little background about yourself and how you ended up in your role as Executive Director? Sure. I uh, knew that I wanted to work with kids. I went to college to be a teacher and a coach. I uh, ended up uh, teaching and coaching for my first four years out of college from the Grand Rapids area. Then became a high school AD and principal for the next three years, and then at age 29, got hired at the MHSAA as an assistant director. So I've been with the association for the last 15 years, uh, the first 14 as the assistant director, and when Jack Roberts retired last summer, mm -hmm. I became uh, the association's fifth full-time director, which still is a little bit odd to hear, but uh, so yeah, I've just completed my first year as the director, and uh, fall sports are here, and we're on to year number two. Excellent. So you, we were talking earlier, you had uh, some personal, you played football, you played some basketball, some baseball, uh, and then progressing through coaching and now kind of executive leadership. Talk about kind of your experience um, as an athlete dealing with concussions, coach dealing with concussion, and now from the executive level, kind of how, how that has, your view has changed and then uh, kind of how the knowledge of concussion has kind of trickled down into sports. I think I can put the experience as an athlete and a coach really in the same bucket. That was back in an era to where when you got hit in the head, you would go over, uh, coach would look at your eyes or a trainer and maybe give you some smelling salts. And in the line was, you know, you just got your bell rung or, or uh, I had one coach, uh, you just got your egg scrambled a little bit. And as long as you really didn't have any uh, severe symptoms, you know, a few minutes later, uh, once you kind of had your, your win back, you were back in the game and away we went. Uh, people have asked me, you know, over the last decade at the MHSAA, what's changed the most in athletics? And without question, it's health and safety. That the focus on not just with concussion, but that's a huge part of it, but everything from a new heat policy, um, sudden cardiac with getting AEDs in as many mm. places as possible. So I think the emphasis, rightly so, on improved health and safety for kids, that things need to start and end with making sure that our kids are safe. And certainly concussion has been a big part of that. Now what's really pulled concussion apart is we now have a state law that deals with concussion specifically. And so it's really, it's forced us, I think, to have some policy in place, but it, it's really given us an opportunity, I think, to be creative, to build some partnerships, and really make our kids as safe as we can when it deals with all things head injury. Right. So the state law, you, you raised that issue, um, and I think most of our audience knows that all 50 states have laws that regulate concussion management, uh, including in Washington, D.C., um, but a little bit unique to Michigan and Michigan uh, High School Athletic Association uh, is the tracking of concussions. So while the laws mandate uh, management, uh, Michigan, and I think Oregon is the only other state that actually tracks the number uh, of injuries that are occurring in different sports and in different mm -hmm. contexts. Can you talk a little bit about how you're using those data um, to change rules or implement safety protocols um, across all of our sports uh, that you guys are, are regulating? Sure, so with the state law, as you said, Steve, uh, you, you've got kind of the, the check boxes that mm -hmm. parents have to complete and coaches need to complete. And the fact of the matter is we took a step back and said, well, if, if ever, let's say a governmental agency is going to want to have data and information and how many and how did they happen, um, we really took a leap and said, you know what, we need to start requiring that our schools report every concussion to us. Rather than say the legislature, one of the, the Department of Health and Human Services, for them to knock on the door of every one of the high schools in Michigan, um, we can somewhat easily collect that data. Um, we get reported each year um, every concussion that takes place at a member school. We know that in some places the data is more reliable, especially if a school has a full-time or even a part-time licensed athletic trainer. That's going to be more reliable than, say, a small school maybe in our Upper Peninsula, for example, um, with those schools. But by us collecting that data, we've been able now with three years of full data, been, in, been able to identify some problem areas. Football continues to be the area with the most concussions. Mm -hmm. But it's also given us some data that we may not have um, discovered immediately. That, for example, our dual gender sports. So let's mm -hmm. take soccer, for example, boy soccer and girls soccer. Every year of the data, the incidence of concussion is higher with our girls soccer player than boys. Same exact thing when it comes to basketball. Mm -hmm. Girls' uh, incidents have been higher than boys. So 
it's confirmed some things that I think we, we always thought were the case, but it's also, I think, uh, given us some data that now when we look at playing rules, we look at return to play protocols, mm -hmm. and really the next steps that we take dealing with concussion, we're hoping that data will help us uh, really stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, I'm sure they will, and I'm, it's exciting to me as a researcher that you're starting to look uh, into those data. So Mark, it's, it's great that Michigan uh, High School Athletic Association is tracking these injuries, but what we see from our end, from the research end, is that student athletes um, are really still apprehensive to report, whether it's to a coach, athletic trainer, or parent. What sort of steps um, do you see we could take to kind of empower the athletes to, to be more forthcoming with these injuries? Sure, and that, that's a very valid concern. Uh, I think we've taken a big step forward to where we've really given parents an awful lot of information to where I think we've equipped parents with some tools to ask some of those questions of kids um, to where now concussion is on mom and dad's radar to where maybe a decade ago that certainly wasn't the case. I think we've also made a lot of progress within our coaching ranks that every year uh, our coaches have to complete mandated training and part of that every year deals with concussion awareness, the signs, the symptoms. And so I think we're starting to get some real buy-in from our coaches that when a student is injured with a possible head injury, if there's any doubt, we sit them out. Um, changing that mindset of, you know, you need to, um, you know, bear down or we need you back in there. It's the fourth quarter, it's the sixth inning, whatever the case may be. And I really think that our coaches are buying into the fact that, hey, when it comes to health and wellness, especially when it deals with um, a possible head injury, we got to stop, we sit them out, we evaluate, and uh, that's an opportunity then for somebody else. So it really had to be a cultural change in our state, really getting parents, uh, you know, I think at home asking the right questions as well as with coaches. Now, one barrier that we've tried to eliminate is every single one of our 200,000 kids statewide that are in a, a middle school or high school activity each year is we now have concussion care insurance. So in other words, if mom or dad were sitting at home saying, well, gosh, you know, my son or daughter, they they may have a head injury, but you know we've uh, we've maxed out our health savings account. Or if we take them in to, to even get checked out, it's going to be a two hundred dollar office copay. Well, the insurance that we now have, free of charge to our schools, is kids can go in, get evaluated, and then anything that's left unpaid by their insurance, our coverage picks up. So again, just removing another barrier, which for a lot of families, that financial barrier can be a big one and uh, just another way we're trying to improve the overall culture. Yeah, it's, uh, I think you've hit on a key part with the medical care, access to medical care, and it's great to hear what you guys are doing. So uh, you, you touched on the coaches and training, uh, and that's, it's awesome. I think it's incredible that um, you know, the people on the front lines, the coaches, getting them educated on it, um, particularly when an athlete trainer isn't around, it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, but the state law only dictates training for uh, high school coaches. What are your thoughts on steps that can be taken um, to, to mandate or get more education into the youth ranks where maybe it's, um, it's a parent that's just volunteering uh, or maybe just a neighborhood uh, you know, friend that just loves the sport and is stepping forward and, and trying to volunteer and do the right thing, uh, but just doesn't have access to that information. Sure, you know, lawmakers and uh, policy makers in our state, they usually start with our front door mm -hmm. because they know it can be one knock, one conversation, and then we're able to connect with over 1,600 high schools and middle schools in our state. We struggle with that same thing of how do we now reach that youth football coach? How do we reach that travel soccer coach mm -hmm. or that AAU basketball coach? Same issues, same problems, but they're not getting that training. One thing we're trying to do is really use our schools. Many of these youth programs do have an alliance or a link with the local community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here just outside of Ann Arbor, a community like Chelsea, Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, we try and hope that that information through the Chelsea Athletic Department, when they then meet with their local youth coaches, that that same message messaging that same um, mantra of look for the signs and symptoms. If you see a possible injury and you have any doubt, sit them out. Mm -hmm. Some of those very basic things, we're trying to get down to the community and grassroots level to really make sure that uh, those areas without training are getting some. You know, I give high marks to USA Hockey. You know, the training that they do with their coaches before the season, a big segment of that is certainly on concussion. So that's been one model that's out there. US Lacrosse does some really good things too. But uh, that is a, a constant issue, a constant battle, and I think that's something we just chip away at every day. That's great, that's great. 
So in your role as executive director, you, um, you know, you've been in the role for a year now, um, and quite big shoes to fill from your predecessor. Um, what are you hoping to achieve uh, maybe in the concussion space or even beyond in your tenure uh, while, you, while you're in that position? So we've, uh, for the first time ever, the MHSAA this coming school year will have a sports yeah. medicine advisory committee. We were the one state that didn't have one. We really leaned on the national uh, sports medical group mm -hmm. for kind of guidance, but we're gonna have our own homegrown committee mm -hmm. within our state and we're really excited right. about that. One of the first big tasks of that group the time has really come for us to look at all of our concussion protocols, especially the return to learn, return to participate, and then return to competition. With our current policy, it really has to be a sign off of one of the big four, an MD, a DO, mm -hmm. a physician's assistant, or a nurse practitioner. The same four that can complete a pre-participation physical are the same four that can return a concussed athlete to play. Well, in the meantime, when the policy was created until today, uh, Michigan now licenses athletic trainers, and now licensed athletic trainers have to work under the supervision of a physician. And so because so many of our schools do have a licensed athletic trainer, is there a part that they can play with that return to play? So I just think now getting on to almost a decade, and the original policy is really untouched, um, that'll be our next step. I think it's time to revisit that and make sure that we're using best practices and uh, really incorporating everybody within our healthcare system for the betterment of kids. So Mark, uh, when we talk about concussion, usually the conversation starts gravitating towards football and, and clearly concussions occur in that sport. Um, it's the most popular sport in the, in the country relative to the number of injuries that occur. Uh, but concussions occur in every sport, things like uh, women's soccer or cheerleading. Can you talk about some of the things that the uh, Athletic Association is doing to address uh, some of the things, some of the sports that don't really uh, hit the headlines, so to speak. Sure. Starting with football, it, it's interesting. That's really become as much of a PR battle as it has a, a data-driven battle. Um, you know, football had the movie Concussion, mm -hmm. all of the issues that the NFL has had. And, you know, one thing that's been a little disappointing is the NFL strategy has been to deflect and say, well, the problem is really at the levels beneath us, mm -hmm. at the college level and the high school level. Um, we're still trying to kind of fight that that uh, battle with parents. You know, the question that President Obama got, you know, would if you had a son, would you let them play football? Mm -hmm. um, I'd make the case that today the game of football has never been safer with the, uh, the really the year-round training opportunities that are there, the advancements in equipment, the change in playing rules to where we're really getting the head out of the game, and then most importantly, the different ways that we're coaching the game, the amount of contact that we allow in a practice, the, the type of drills and the mentality. Um, a lot of good things going on in football to where we want to keep that game healthy and keep it growing. Um, but other sports, you're exactly right, also have some challenges. Uh, our cheerleading population, we have sideline cheer in the fall and then uh, competitive cheer in the winter time. And those are a couple of sports where we do have high incidence of concussion. And just as we've had to educate that football coach about the signs and symptoms, our cheerleading coaches need to hear that same messaging, that if you have an athlete where um, they've come down, maybe they've been hit by one of their teammates on a stunt or on a, on a landing, um, we've got to follow that exact same system that the football coach or the hockey coach or the soccer coach is using out in a, in a uh, competitive environment. So uh, it's been interesting that with our cheerleading population, the insurance coverage that we have, a good number of our serious injuries do happen in cheer. Um, again, with no protective equipment other than a thin mat when it comes to the competitive season. Um, so it just shows you that this isn't just a football issue, it's really across the board. Yeah, for sure. Mark, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your insight, particularly from the executive level from the High School Athletic Association. Good to be with you, Steve. Thank you.